The only thing we have to fear is... Fear is... December 7th, 1941, the Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii from the air. I repeat, the Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor in Hawaii from the air. 75 years ago, on February 19, 1942, Franklin D. Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066. This order empowered the Secretary of War and military commanders and gave them the authority to prescribe military areas which any or all persons may be excluded. Even though the executive order did not explicitly mandate that all Japanese Americans, regardless of their loyalty or citizenship, to evacuate the West Coast, it let military commanders call the cards about what they think should happen. In panic while fueled by fear, Commanding General John DeWitt chose to enact exclusionary practices and curfew that made the construction of the camps possible. <laughs> and so, a line of exclusion was established along the West Coast. From Washington State to Oregon to California and into Arizona. American people of Japanese descent, including first generations, also known as Issei, and U.S. born citizens, the second generations, called Nisei, were told to leave their homes and businesses. Taken by bus and train, around 120,000 Japanese Americans were told to evacuate of which two-thirds were U.S. citizens and half of those were children. These camps were located in remote deserts or swamplands throughout the West and in Arkansas. These camps were mostly makeshift barracks, with families and children cramped together in small living spaces and limited supplies. Barbed wires, watchtowers, and armed guards surrounded these relocation centers. Korematsu, a 22-year-old worker, violated the civilian exclusion order number 34 by not reporting for the evacuation. He went to court, was convicted, and then sent out to the internment camps. Hirabayashi, a college student and a pacifist, was confident in his rights as a U.S. citizen, so he resisted the curfew and the exclusion order. Instead of registering for relocation, he went to the FBI and turned himself in. To challenge the constitutionality of Executive Order 9066, both cases were taken to the Supreme Court. But their convictions were upheld. The court used the strict scrutiny test to uphold the constitutionality of the curfew. Justice Hugo Black, delivering the court's opinion on Korematsu's case, stated that in military urgency and wartime, the need to protect against espionage justified the exclusion order. On July 1942, a young woman named Mitsuya Endo filed a writ of habeas corpus to challenge her continued incarceration. After her petition was dismissed without explanation, it was invoked to the Supreme Court. On December 19, 1944, in the landmark lawsuit Ex Parte Endo, the U.S. Supreme Court unanimously ruled that citizens who are conceitedly loyal could not be held in internment camps. This ultimately led to Japanese Americans being allowed to return to the West Coast in January 1945. But even though they were no longer imprisoned, their homes and businesses were gone and racial epithets greeted them. Propelled by fear, wartime hysteria, and failure of leadership, 120,000 individuals were unlawfully imprisoned and stripped away from their rights. In 1983, about 40 years after the charges, both cases, Korematsu's and Hirabayashi's, were brought under Karam no Bias, and their convictions were overturned, and in 1988, Congress passed the Civil Liberties Act and gave reparations for victims of the internment camps. We are privileged to see, in hindsight, the bigotry that was able to cause this discrimination. It is essential that the judicial branch keeps the balancing act between individual rights and national security, majority rule and minority rights, social justice, and civil liberties because through judicial reviews, courts test and assess the constitutionality of laws. Recently, echoes of fear for national security have been evident as executive order titled Protecting the Nation from Foreign Terrorist Entry into the United States were issued by Trump in an attempt to combat terrorism. But again, as the Japanese internment camps events, it is at times as this when we cannot falter into the mindset of nativism and exclusiveness, operating with hatred and fear, repeating the mistakes of the past. Resistance being the solution to injustice, we need to be awake, not fearful. We need to remember the lessons of the past and take every step towards the future, being mindful of our children's opportunities.